I mean, I think you should definitely sacrifice a chicken and and rub the blood on your elbows. Uh, apparently, that also helps you write well. Um, I yeah, I've heard that in- and blood in your Christmas cocktails does the same right. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to do those things. Also, standing on your head and chanting, I will write, I will write uh, for 20 minutes every morning. Excellent advice from the contemporary writing guides. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pleasure of the Text Podcast, a shared imagined space where readers and writers make meaning together. We are your hosts, Shannon and Gareth. Good morning, Shannon. Um, I feel like we should talk about why this has arrived late. Why has this arrived late? I was going to let it slip under the doormat and, you know, hopefully no one noticed. But why is it arriving late? Uh, Technology issues, everyone. Audio issues. We're still learning. It's a learning curve for us. And I had some audio issues. And here we are. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's it's worth noting that that was possibly the best recording we've ever done in terms of the content. It was almost it was the best mythological. Song in the world, no. Yeah. And we don't remember what it was. <laughs> you can't remember it. So this is going to be a tribute episode to the episode we did record that was much better than what we're going to do now. Yeah. And for those uh, super dedicated listeners, future Patreons, if you want to listen to the best episode in the world that's super crackly and has lightning coming through it, uh, yeah, just send us a request and we might send it over to you guys, you know, behind the scenes, what are Shannon and Gareth getting up to on the best episode of their um, career so far, but, you know, the trajectory is onwards and upwards. <laughs> I don't know. I really feel like we hit the peak I feel, as I often do when I wake up in the morning, that it's all downhill from here. But, you know, maybe the peak was so high, it'll be all right. Well, I never feel like I hit the peak. Um, I mean, but we are in two different stages of our lives, so I definitely don't want to hit my peak. (laughs) You can't say that to a woman in her 30s. You've hit your peak. It's downhill from here. How rude. That that does sound dangerous, (laughs) doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Okay, well, back to topic. We are doing the second segment of our Point of View podcast for the creative writing um, episodes that we are producing within The Pleasure of the Text. And today we are talking about third person point of view. And now there are three third person point of views. Do, Do you want to talk about that a bit, Gareth? Yes, yes, I do. So, so yes, last week we did first and second person, and they are um, singular in nature. But the third person point of view uh, can be divided up into into three approaches, three broad approaches. So, the first of these is omniscient, um, and we will discuss these in in more detail shortly. Third person limited which is the by far the most common point of view used in contemporary writing and third person objective. And essentially the difference between the three is the closeness of the narrative point of view to the reader in a sense. So in one, you have the, the, uh, the narrative voice in your ear and in, uh, and then we work our way through limited to objective where the narrative viewpoint appears to be missing, much like watching a movie without a voiceover. Uh, all you can see is what the characters are doing and saying. I think that's what it boils down to. Um, and the first one we were going to discuss was a uh, third person omniscient, mostly because it's not nearly so common anymore. Um, You will find it in comedy, particularly, um, where the narrative voice can... um, Did you just see some comedy fly past you, Shannon? It it looked like you did. Um, Yeah, maybe. Yeah? Uh, Well, that's good. I hope you grabbed it. Uh, Yeah, so basically, you know, where the narrative voice can sort of comment on what's occurring, um, and that's much more common in, in comedy. Um, I feel like omniscient third person was more common in the latter year, so maybe the 19th and 20th century, or am I incorrect, where the writer had more of an input input within the text? 
No, I don't think you are. Uh, I don't think there's any particular reason for that except for trends, trends in writing. Um, at the moment, we are quite obsessed with reality in life and in art and reality effects. Uh, you know, people say, I like the story more because it was true, which I always find very funny um, because, you know, ultimately, like with history, um, you're never going to get an entirely unbiased and complete view of anything. So, yeah. I mean, I suppose that's much like being alive, but um, the more you attempt to create a reality effect, it is an effect, and the more artificial you're being. The most pretentious writers, one could argue, are those that attempt to capture reality. So that's, you know, that's a little controversial thing to start the episode off with. It wasn't in the greatest ever episode, so a little bit of value adding. Um, yeah. So do you, do you want to start with, uh, so this is a comedy. Uh, it's Pride and Prejudice, the opening uh, page or so. Uh, we talked about Pride and Prejudice in a previous episode uh, and identified it as, you know, Jane Austen's work in any case as a uh, very much the sort of founding works of what might be called now a uh, modern romantic comedy. Yes, we did. And we also talked a bit about V.S. Napol's opinion on Jane Austen. So definitely go check out that podcast for um, some also controversial views. But I'll get right into it. Uh, so the extract from Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a large fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such men may be on his first entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of someone or other of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennet, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennet replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been here and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennet made no answer. Do you not want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. You want to tell me and I have no objection to hearing it. This was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, that he came down on Monday in a chase and four to see the place, and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately, that he is to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of next week. What is his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune, four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? My dear Mr. Bennet, replied his wife, how can he be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Is that his design in settling here? Design? Nonsense. How can he talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them, and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes. They have none of them much to recommend them, replied he. They are all silly and ignorant like other girls, but Lizzie has something more of quickness than her sister's. Mr. Bennet, how can you abuse your own children in such a way? You take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion for my poor nerves. You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these last 20 years at least. Mr. Bennett was so odd a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humour, reserve and caprice that the experience of three and twenty years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his character. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information and uncertain temper. When she was discontented, she fancied herself nervous the business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and news. Who's saying all that? None of this is happening in the moment, is it? And it's not Lizzie's. I mean, Lizzie's the star of the star. What am I talking about? Lizzie's the protagonist. Uh, and it's not her point of view, at least not clearly. No, and she's not in the room 
thinking it with them. So there's obviously a um, omniscient present presence here. Yeah, a, an omnipresence, indeed. I mean, that's the other way to look at it. Not just omniscient, but omnipresent. Uh, the narrator is always there in the space, uh, mediating what you know. Uh, and we have, you know, we have that wonderful first line. It is the truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a large fortune must be in want of a wife. Um, now, that's not true. It's not universally acknowledged. Um, and that's yeah. what makes it so funny. Um, but again, you know, that voice this narrative voice that is a godlike voice um, is lying to us uh, to amuse us. Yeah. So it, it's important to remember that the the narrative God is not like, you know, the real deal, not speaking truths all the time. Yeah. I always feel like the omnipresence is kind of a messenger in the story acting, telling the reader stuff about the characters that they not, may not necessarily think or know. So it's mm. like this intermediate messenger yeah, between and, the and writer and reader in a sense as well. Absolutely. And, I mean, you could present all this stuff in one way or another. It's done this way for comedic effect. That is, that is the function of third-person omniscient in this opening mm. scene. Yeah, and you get that in the final paragraph where the – commentary on the differences between Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, th this is also biased and a bit skewed. I mean, one could argue that Mr. Bennett, you know, is uh, a little bit of a dick. Um, you know, he, he sort of says that, uh, you know, that his daughters are silly and ignorant like other girls. Um, and Mrs. Bennett is trying to defend them. Uh, but the, the narrator tells us that he's quite a quick-witted and delightful man and she's a simplistic and hard-to-love woman. And, and that's something else. This narrator is going against the scene to an extent. Mm. Um, certainly she's a bit annoying. Um, but his indifference, which is, feels very practiced, you know, like he's, he's winding her up. This is, this is what he does with his time, uh, is also potentially a touch annoying. It would certainly be annoying for her. Um, but if we've ever dealt with it ourselves in our, in our personal relationships, we might well find it a tad, a tad annoying too. Yeah, so he's kind of like a pot stirrer, which is what my mum used to call me, stirring up my sister. Yeah, exactly. But the, the narrator is telling us, no, no, no. He's, he's a terrific fellow, very complex, well worth getting to know. There's not much to her. That's what it is. And that's something you can do in third-person omniscient that you cannot do in the other two third-person point of views. It, it, you will not get that flexibility and space to kind of say, don't worry about what you're seeing. I'm telling you it's this other thing. Yeah, so in terms of... Uh, space when you when we move into third person limited using that technical tool in our writing we don't have that space so with third person limited it essentially is the inner monologue of the character that you are concentrating that scene on most books these days are written in the third person limited so that's he she they and i would say that most books are written in this and they don't jump across unless there's a scene change. But Virginia Woolf, Woolf very much in her Lighthouse piece jump from point of view to point of view quite masterfully. Did you have anything to add on that, Gareth? Uh, yeah, just one thing. So in Third Person Limited, you are getting uh, typically a, um, a monolithic or monologic narrative. So everything in the text is coloured by the perspective of the third person limited narrator so it's not just a rainy day it could be a gray and gloomy day that is not a statement of fact that is what is in the narrator's psyche mm -hmm. uh, so everything in the text reflects 
on the third person limited narrator in the same way that it does in first person, but less obviously. Yeah. Um, and so you have this opportunity to create character through every moment of the text, how you just decide to describe a park, for example, there are many ways one could describe a park. Um, but you know, you could, you could take a very dim view and have sort of leaning trees and, and then you could have a very happy view and have the trees sort of bending around ecstatically. So, so you can create a sense of character and mood because mm. you're always framing things from a, from a singular uh, subjectivity. Do you think that, because I, I thought it just popped off in my head, new writers missed using that opportunity um, mm. of framing a lot of the characters' experiences through their surroundings. I mean, we like to describe a, a it's a classic a trope or cliche at the start of a book. There's a strong storm, rainy night. Um, they describe it in that sense, but it's not really aiding the character development at all. It just happens to be something they're utilizing that story. Yeah, I think I think emerging writers often do miss the opportunity, and, and, so, and so do published writers. Um, you know, the, you have these these sort of fascinating ideas, like to create a character that's not likable. You know, they have to kick a dog or something. It's just nonsense. They could simply look at the dog in an unsympathetic way, and what we would be getting is a statement, a point, a statement of point of view that we might mistake for the reality of the situation, and that would be fine. But we would get this sense that the worldview of the book, if you like, is a little bitter. Uh, and so you can build the character that way, and they don't have to, you know, twirl their moustache to be evil. Uh, you know, they can have quite an evil way of describing the world, and and that yeah. is that is why third person limited is such a powerful and uh, ubiquitous um, point of view in contemporary yeah. fiction. It's huge what you can do with it. And I think also in third person limited, you have the ability to have unreliable narration. So we had it in Omniscient as well with the writer God describing things, but also in third person limited. Um, uh, the character could describe that dog, oh, what a dirty, disgusting mutt. But is it really a d dirty, disgusting mutt? Is it just a dog that's run for, away from home? So you always have to be kind of on your the edge of your seat, kind of looking out for that potential lie if it's there. Yeah, and characters lie to themselves all the time. You know, you get up mm, in the morning as and we look do at yourself as well. in the mirror, right? Exactly so, yeah. I mean, this is very common to human nature. Uh, and so in many ways, I think third person limited most captures the human experience. Uh, and again, I think that's why it's so common in, in contemporary writing. Um, so we're going to, we're going to read an extract from, um, Catherine Mansfield, wonderful, wonderful short story writer from New Zealand. One of the, um, key figures in the development of modernism. Uh, in literature. Uh, you know she's good because Virginia Woolf didn't think much of her. Uh, that's always a sign. Um, Margaret Atwood loves um, Catherine Mansfield as well. Oh, how could you not? Yeah, no, yeah. I think, and this is the thing, here's a bit of third person limited for you. Um, Virginia Woolf said Catherine Mansfield is overrated and if we were going to write this as a scene, that would be the dialogue. But we would be describing her reading of Mansfield's texts as, mm. as you know, somewhat, somewhat impressed or, or, or resentful, you know, um, you, you can basically, uh, take a piece of writing that's quite lovely and then have it characterized as florid or, or too prosaic. Um, and the reader starts to go, Oh, hang on a second. This, this worldview is a little bit resentful, perhaps even a little bit jealous or uh, possessive yeah. of the title of, you know, mother of modernism. So, um, yeah, Catherine Mansfield, wonderful. And, you know, as Australians, we can steal her from the New Zealanders anytime we like. And so she's a great Australian writer. Um, yeah. And so we should. All right. So this is from, uh, this is from Miss Brill. 
one of the stories in The Garden Party and other stories, which is if you're going to read any Catherine Mansfield, this would be the collection to read. It was her last published collection set in New Zealand and probably she hit her peak with this with this text. Um, Miss Brill. Although it was so brilliantly fine, the blue sky powdered with gold and great spots of light like white wine splashed over the Jardins public, Miss Brill was glad that she had decided on her fur. The air was motionless, but when you opened your mouth, there was just a faint chill, like a chill from a glass of iced water before you sip, and now and again a leaf came drifting from nowhere from the sky. Miss Brill put up her hand and touched her fur. Dear little thing, it was nice to feel it again. She had taken it out of its box that afternoon, shaken out the moth powder, given it a good brush, and rubbed the life back into the dim little eyes. "'What has been happening to me?' said the sad little eyes. "'Oh, how sweet it was to see them snap at her again from the red eider down. "'She could have taken it off and laid it on her lap and stroked it. "'She felt a tingling in her hands and arms, but that came from walking, she supposed. "'And when she breathed, something light and sad, no, not sad exactly, "'something gentle seemed to move in her bosom.' There were a number of people out this afternoon, far more than last Sunday, and the band sounded louder and gayer, and what they played was warm, sunny, yet there was just a faint chill, a something, what was it? Not sadness, no, not sadness, a something that made you want to sing. The tune lifted, lifted, the light shone, and it seemed to Miss Brill that in another moment all of them, all the whole company, would begin singing. And Miss Brill's eyes filled with tears, and she looked smiling at all the other members of the company. Yes, we understand, we understand, she thought, though what they understood she didn't know. Just at that moment, a boy and girl came and sat down. They were beautifully dressed. They were in love. The hero and heroine, of course, just arrived from his father's yacht, and still soundlessly singing, still with that trembling smile, Miss Brill prepared to listen. No, not now, said the girl. Not here, I can't. But why? Because of that stupid old thing at the end there, asked the boy. Why does she come here at all? Who wants her? Why doesn't she keep her silly old mug at home? It's a fur which is so funny, giggled the girl. It's exactly like a fried whiting. I'll be off with you, said the boy in an angry whisper. Then, tell me, ma petite chère. No, not here, said the girl. Not yet. On her way home, she usually bought a slice of honey cake at the baker's. It was her Sunday treat. Sometimes there was an almond in a slice, sometimes not. It made a great difference. If there was an almond, it was like carrying home a tiny present, a surprise, something that might very well not have been there. She hurried on the almond Sundays and struck the match for the kettle in quite a dashing way. But today she passed the baker's by climbed the stairs, went into the dark little room, her room like a cupboard, and sat down on the red eider down. She sat there for a long time. The box that the fur came out of was on the bed. She unclasped the necklet quickly, quickly without looking, laid it inside. But when she put the lid on, she thought she heard something crying. Isn't that a lovely story? It is. It's very sad as well. It is very sad. And of course, the question we must ask at the end is, you know, is the fur crying? No. No, it is not. At least I assume not. Uh, And, you know, you couldn't have the fur crying as it is here, as it's being told. You know, we're told the fur is crying. This would not work in third person omniscient or indeed in third person objective, as we'll discover later. It can only work in third person limited because the point of view we're limited to is, of course, Miss Brills. And and she does this thing, you know, she talks about sadness and she says, no, not sad exactly. And then later she says, not sadness, no, not sadness. And of course, it's precisely sadness. Mm. Uh, You know, thou doth protest too much, Miss Brill. Um, the, the very uh, invocation of sadness, even in its absence and its negation, is raising sadness up into the reader's mind. Yeah. 
And yeah, she's lying to herself. She doesn't want to acknowledge it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. She is. Um, so you're right. She's un, she's unreliable, not necessarily um, by intent, uh, but one of the advantages for us is that she is only semi-present in this narrative, in a sense. We have um, access to a broader reality that is nevertheless coming through her point of view, but which her conscious mind doesn't grasp. So whereas we had an omnipresent narrator in the first piece, we have essentially, in a way, a semi-present narrator, even though everything that's written is from their point of view and coloured by their view of the world. Their active intervention in the text is much less, much less frequent. Yeah. Um, And in terms of colouring the environment and other characters through the point of view of your main character, I'm just going to read this line. Just at that moment, a boy and a girl came and sat down. They were beautifully dressed. They were in love. Just reading this line, it makes you think, you know, she's dusted off this old uh, fur to put around her to feel beautiful again. And, um, you know, she gets referred to as old, ugly thing. And uh, there's no mention of another person in her life. So she's where I'm assuming in my reading that she's not with someone, she's not in love. And so that is juxtaposed this, this couple against her own existence quite nicely without saying it. I'm, I'm sad and alone. I'm old and alone. Um, it's in this scenario that we get that picture painted very elegantly. Yeah, we do. It's it's beautifully done. Um, mm. It's subtle. Yes. Uh, and, Don't and we just love subtlety? Subtlety is a wonderful thing. Uh, while you were uh, talking, I very sneakily ran to Google because I was pretty sure that um, Catherine Mansfield died in 1923. So it'll be uh, mm-hmm. centenary next year. However, I really couldn't remember when she was born. So I checked that out. It was 1888. So she was 35 when she died. What did she die from? I think it was consumption. I didn't look at that. <laughs> but I consumption? Think, I think, yeah, I think it was tuberculosis, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, pretty yeah, common, yeah, yeah. common thing. That may have been why she moved back to New Zealand too, possibly – because she was in England for a time, I believe. Oh, that explains why a lot of these uh, famous writers know about her. Because I was, I always saw in the back of my mind, how do people know about Catherine Mansfield in New Zealand? I mean, we weren't a big literary scene back then. Are we now? Who knows? But yeah, that's okay. That answers that question. Thank you. And I just love the way you're using we. See, as an Australian, you've already like scooped up Catherine Mansfield and stolen her. And it's, uh, it's delightful. Yeah, New Zealand is pretty close. You know, we're the um, stealers of the Pavlovas. We might as well just steal her as well. And answering another question that people in the audience might be having, uh, I think is, when like when do you use either or of these points of view can you change and i just wanted to read a segment out from here so third person limited slipping into omniscient and this is an example from the making of a story uh so here's a very good example of a shift in point of view that might be considered an error claire sat on the bus wringing her hands and trying not to cry This was going to be her first time away from home and she was already homesick. Already the lure of camp from reading those brochures was fading. She moved slightly in her seat to allow room for a young man about her own age who was carrying what looked to be a heavy satchel. He looked at Claire and felt pity, so he took out of his pocket a piece of chocolate and offered it to her. Do you see how we suddenly shift from third-person point of view limited to Claire to one that includes insight into what the young man is feeling. Whether this is an error or something that adds to the story is only something that readers of the complete story can decide. The point of view police will always decry this sort of shift, but the fact remains that many fine stories embody shifts of this kind. It's entirely about what you can get away with. Bravo. Bravo. Alice LaPlante. I'm going to hold it up. Apparently, I don't do this well, so I'll hold it in front of my face. The Making of a yeah. Story. 
Um, sometimes I believe it's also called Method and Madness, the making of a story. But anyway, Alice Le- LaPlante, it's a Norton critical edition. Um, <clears throat> and we would recommend this book to emerging writers or indeed anyone who has any interest whatsoever in writing. It's a great guide, isn't it? And it's one that tries to um, smash some of the myths of writing. And she does it there. It's entirely about what you can get away with. Of course it is. Forcing yourself to arbitrarily obey a rule which does not actually add or improve your writing is lunacy. It's madness in our time. Um, what would you call it? It was, uh, it's sort of, uh, now what would be the, the story writing version of political correctness? It's like creative writing method gone mad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are some myth myths that we've heard recently? Um, I mean, I think you should definitely sacrifice a chicken and, and rub the blood on your elbows. Uh, apparently that also helps you write well. Um, I yeah, I've heard unicorn in- blood in your Christmas cocktails does the same right. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to do those things. Also, standing on your head and chanting, I will write, I will write, uh, for 20 minutes every morning, excellent advice from the contemporary writing guides. Uh, we may be being a bit sarky here, but th- some of the rules are beyond stupid, and even the slightest scratching at them makes them collapse in a heap. So if you want to, if you want to, a manual that will uh, really help you with understanding your own writing, The Making of a Story, Alice LaPlante, Norton Critical Guides. Highly recommended. They're not paying us for this. Why aren't they paying us for this, Shannon? We should have contacted them and said, we'll endorse you. Yeah, we should have. Oh, man. Um, And, I mean, this book is good and also kind of what we're doing here, teaching writers about what's important, understanding how their writing works so they can understand uh, breaking their own rules meaningfully, um, doing it well. So you're not just jumping from head to head in terms of the point of view, uh, first person, no, third person point of view limited. You're actually doing it for a reason. What is that reason? Is it a good reason or should we just stick to a single character? So it's really good to understand the different tools that you can use in your craft box as a writer, but not feel pigeonholed into these rules. Yeah. I mean, it's it's important to understand what's invisible in writing. Third person limited is largely invisible. Um, we just accept it. We understand it on an instinctive level. Um, and it's important to understand it on a conscious level and understand how it works and what value it adds and why sticking to it consistently can be uh, an asset. But if straying from it for a particular reason adds to your writing, you know, knock yourself out. If you can get away with it and, you know, the police don't capture you, this is the point of view police who apparently are everywhere and they probably are. But imagine they're off for donuts while you're, uh, while you're doing a naughty little bit of rule breaking and just go for it. I say, yeah. Imagine they're talking to the grammar police, um, and all those other police types at the, at the, yeah. At the textual policeman's ball, they're all there. Yeah, the and now is the time gallery. to break those rules. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on to the final, um, third person point of view, and that is third person objective. So I'm going to read the extract from the lottery and then we'll probably uh, break it down into what is happening in this piece. The morning of June 27th was clear and sunny with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square between the post office and the bank around 10 o'clock. In some towns, there were so many people that the lottery took two days and had to be started on June the 26th. But in this village, where there were only about 300 people, the whole lottery took less than two hours, so it could begin at 10 o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. Remember, Mr. Summers said, take the slips and keep them folded until each person has taken one. Harry, you help little Dave. Mr. Graves took the hand of the little boy who came willingly with him up to the box. Take a paper out of the box, Davy. 
Mr. Summers said. Davy put his hand into the box and laughed. Take just one paper, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you hold it for him. Mr. Graves took the child's hand and removed the folded paper from the tight fist and held it while little Dave stood next to him and looked up at him wonderingly. Nancy next, Mr. Summers said. Nancy was 12 and her school friends breathed heavily as she went forward switching her skirt and took a slip daintily from the box. Bill Jr., Mr. Summers said, and Billy, his face red and his feet over large, near knocked the box over as he got a paper out. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. She hesitated for a minute, looking round defiantly, and then set her lips and went up to the box. She snatched a paper out and held it behind her. Bill, Mr. Summers said, and Bill Hutchinson reached into the box and felt around, bringing his hand out at last with a slip of paper in it. The crowd was quiet. A girl whispered, I hope it's not Nancy, and the sound of the whisper reached the edges of the crowd. It's not the way it used to be, old man Warner said clearly. People ain't the way they used to be. All right, Mr. Summers said. Open the papers. Harry, you open little Dave's. Mr. Graves opened the slip of paper and there was a general sigh through the crowd as he held it up and everyone could see that it was blank. Nancy and Bill Jr. opened theirs at the same time and both beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd and holding their slips of paper above their heads. Tessie, Mr. Summers said. There was a pause and then Mr. Summers looked at Bill Hutchinson and Bill unfolded his paper and showed it. It was blank. It's Tessie, Mr. Summers said and his voice was hushed. Show us her paper, Bill. Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. It had a black spot on it, the black spot Mr. Summers had made the night before with a heavy pencil in the coal company office. Bill Hutchinson held it up, and there was a stir in the crowd. All right, folks, Mr. Summers said. Let's finish quickly. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use stones. The pile of stones the boys had made earlier was ready. There were stones on the ground with the blowing scraps of paper that had come out of the box. Mrs. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it up with both hands and turned to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. Mrs. Dunbar had small stones in both hands and she said, gasping for breath. I can't run at all. You'll have to go ahead and I'll catch up with you. The children had stones already and someone gave little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. Tessie Hutchinson was in the centre of a cleared space by now and she held her hands out desperately as the villagers moved in on her. It isn't fair, she said. A stone hit her on the side of the head. Old man Warner was saying, come on, come on everyone. Steve Adams was in the front of the crowd of villagers with Mrs. Graves beside him. It isn't fair. It isn't right, Mrs. Hutchinson screamed, and then they were upon her. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, at the start of this story, I think it's a, um, a lottery, you know, you pull a number out of a box and you win a prize, you win a gift basket for Christmas, and then you know, it gets pretty dark very quickly. It does, doesn't it? And I love how we realize little Davy is only Tessie's son right at the end when he's given a few pebbles. How chilling. Shirley Jackson uh, published this in 1948. I think it was 1948. Um, and she got a lot of hate mail and she did get death threats. Um which is, you know, I mean, I think if, if the point of art is to create an emotional effect, uh, well, she nailed it, didn't she? Because <laughs> she yeah. definitely got some emotional effects. So this is third-person objective. Uh, and following, you know, the pattern that we've seen thus far, we can assume that indeed the narrator is absent. Uh, would that be... Um, an omni absence and and indeed they're not there they're making no judgments there is no explanation of anything tessie's fear 
at the beginning when she's when she's pulling out her bit of paper uh you can see from her looking around defiantly snatching the paper out and holding it behind her that conveys a great deal of emotional meaning um but it's done yeah in a subtextual way yeah and there's another line um Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. So we're getting shown and described the action, but we don't know what he's feeling in this moment. I mean, yeah, we find out towards the end that his wife is about to get stoned to death, I'm assuming, but there's no emotion uh, portrayed there. Yeah, and and that that mystery is is fascinating, isn't it? And the description of the stones is chilling, you know, um, and one can imagine how the different kinds of stones are used. Um, and it's, you know, it's a bit upsetting. Uh, so, you know, you can see why people were uh, alarmed by this story. It's a very powerful story. I think it it is uh, a, a comment perhaps on, on religion and ritual. Um, uh, and, and it's a very American story. And I think... Uh, that's also something. I think there's a there's a movie, isn't there? The Purge. Yeah, it reminds me of The Purge. Yeah, so I and think that's what it's that's what they've done with The Purge, right? It's a ritualistic sacrificial day. Yeah, well, you get one night when you can go bludgeon people to death with baseball bats or whatever you desire. Um, and I was just thinking because this is objective, there's no. There's no emotion. So we as a reader have to apply our own thoughts and feelings and subjectivity to make meaning of this text. Um, and that requires so, and, us to be um, involved. Uh, so this, this, this murder that occurs, and surely that is what it is, um, you know, we're kind of involved in it. It feels a little bit like a newspaper article. It has a profound reality effect. I think, um, yeah, and yeah, it's 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 very effective for what it for what it is and for what it's doing. And if you put it in third person limited, it would not be as effective. And certainly, if you put it in third person omniscient, uh, it would collapse completely. I think, in terms yeah. of what it's achieving. So, I guess what we can take from all of that is that it's never an arbitrary choice what kind of uh, third-person point of view you select. Um, And I suppose, you know, bouncing on from last week, um, you could probably see that third-person limited and first-person are the most similar of all the point of views we've covered, Uh, and they are also the most common and somewhat, somewhat interchangeable, but they, they do different things. And so it's very interesting. It's a really interesting exercise to take a first person piece of writing and turn it into third person limited or vice versa and see what does and doesn't work as well when you make that shift, which is quite a quick and easy shift to do uh, on yeah. a surface level. But once you get into the, the weeds of it, suddenly you start to see why it's so important to know what point of view you're going to write in. Uh, or at least what point of view you should have written in. Because, of course, uh, knowing up front is great if it's possible, but most of the time it isn't. So you sort of pick what your gut tells you is the right one, and you find out later if you if you nailed it or not or if you have to shift it. Yeah. So which is your favourite, would you say, Shannon? Um, that's a really... I mean, they're all fantastic fantastic authors that you've just presented us with. In terms of the short story, I think Mrs. Brill is my favourite of the three. But then in terms of the chillingness that you get, uh, I do like the objective um, point of view. But then again, uh, most of my writing is in third person limited. So I think after this, I want to experiment a bit more. And don't we have a writing exercise that we're going to experiment with some of these? Of course we do. Of course we do. Um, I think we'll allow 10 minutes for this one. Yes. So, so this exercise, um, is called strangers 
on a train. So, so essentially, uh, what we want to do is write a scene set on a train or on a train station in the dead of night. The story's protagonist is a blind woman. Uh, it's late at night and she's all alone. Or is she alone? More and more, she begins to think that someone is there with her, watching her. So what we want to do is try and build the tension, or potentially the horror of the story, by using either third-person omniscient, limited, or objective. So you get to decide up front, obviously, which one you're going you're gonna to choose, because that's the nature of writing something down. You need a point of view. Um, and then see how that all falls out. So you may be in both characters' points of view, or there may not be a stranger watching her, and you could you be using her point of view and a universal point of view. Or you could be outside it completely, um, and that would be an interesting exercise in creating tension for the reader where they can see it all happening but have no sense of what the characters are doing and why, a bit like the lottery. So you've got lots of options, um, but essentially the key points set on a set on a train or a train station, dead at night, blind woman is, is the main character, and there may or may not be a stranger watching her that she starts to become aware of. And that's a 10-minute okay. exercise because that's a lot of balls to juggle, I think. So, yeah, count okay. us down. Are you going to count down from 10 like a rocket ship or is that just insane? No, no, no. My rocket ship goes off in three, <laughs> two, one, and let's start.
Okay, that is time. Finish up your sentence, everyone. Ah, well. Well, would you like to go first, Gareth? Well, why not? Why not? I didn't. I didn't get too far into the um, the scene, but I've started laying down some planks. So we'll see what you think. Yeah. Claire lifted her naked thigh off the seat, the vinyl sticking doggedly to her skin. She tugged at a skirt, which was shorter than she would normally wear, but it had been her first interview in months. In any case, she pulled the seat in, fr- in front of her to its forward position, so nobody could see anything. The carriage was quiet and stiflingly stif- the carriage was quiet and stiflingly hot in the absence of the air conditioner's hum. She was sweating, her blouse clinging to her like the vinyl, but this was something she couldn't really do anything about. Besides, she was alone. She could always tell such things. The air was different somehow. Hard to explain to anyone for whom such ideas are unnecessary, but for Claire, her sense of vacuum, of void, was a matter of some pride. She was alone, but still she tugged at her skirt as if someone was there watching her. The thought lingered. It lingered like her breath, and the air around her did indeed seem to shift differently. Perhaps there was someone, just outside the carriage. A pair of pressed trousers, polished shoes, framed within the tinted glass of the window. Or sand shoes, rubber-soled and silent. The naked, muscular calves of a runner. A pursuer. That's all I got to. Mm, Very nice. Um... So, Third Person Limited third person was limited. your intention. Yes. Um, I loved how we got a sense of the character with the short skirt and the blouse. And it kind of gives you a picture of the day because if you're wearing a shorter skirt for an interview, it kind of says something a bit about the society. So, male dominated. So, yeah, you got a lot in that a very short piece. And I can definitely sense the, the plank work that you're building to get that tension at the end yeah and i i think it's fascinating i so i was imagining this this woman who dresses to be seen but cannot see herself and just imagining the process by which one would make decisions and how um i suppose sexuality uh is configured in a sighted way with a non-sighted mm. person. As I was writing that, I was very fascinated by that and, and how she would um, frame this this man, you know, as a man, uh, and what he would be like. And I was, I was a bit reminded of Margaret Atwood's stuff about liking men, so I thought press trousers, polished shoes, all that sort of uh, indicators of a certain self-care. Um, yeah. I have to say I did notice the similarities of describing the footwear to liking men. I like that piece. And also you mentioned she took a lot of pride in living in her void. Uh, It was probably, I mean, I know the exercise. It was probably only then that I might get a glimmering or a thought that there's something not right because she's describing shifts of air um, but not describing sights in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how – Important it is that the reader knows she's not sighted. Um, it's really hard to say. There's the sort of thing where we get to the end of the story and you think, oh, that should have happened much earlier or I should have been hiding that more. It's hard to say at this point. But yeah. um, certainly I know that this piece would not work the way I've approached it if I tried to turn it into omniscient or objective at this point. Much of the work I've already put in would, would cease to be effective. So I'm sort of constrained yeah. now, third person limited all the way. Can we have a listen to your piece now? Yeah, sure. Okay. The steam train left Oxford Station nine minutes and 22 seconds behind schedule. The delay had been caused by a fallen branch on the tracks at Ashfield, a small town, a 20-minute drive away, known for blossoming garden beds of petunias and baked tarts in the summer. The train conductor had tried to make time, valiantly ordering his subordinates to stoke the flames hotter, faster, the steam rising higher in the darkening sky. 
if it hadn't been for the branch or little Johnny, who, bending over the open coal grate, felt the heat on his already sweltering brow collapsed in a heap on the bed of coal, the train may have arrived earlier or later than the time it did. Anne was always going to board, assisted by an aide provided by the train company, aware of her plight. But the devilish man with the crooked cane would not have boarded. His taxi had been caught in the evening traffic. Even with the taxi driver's 45 years of experience, taking the back roads, drug alleys and floozy lanes, he would not have made the train's original departure time. Anne heard the harried clack of a cane seconds after the whistle of the board director, but didn't think much of it. She wanted to escape the endless chatter of the train aide who spoke louder than necessary. She wasn't deaf for goodness sake. Directed to the first class lounge, she directed the aide good day and to be gone. Sighing with relief, she settled in a seat, patting the wrinkles from her skirt. She heard the train door open behind her, the clack of the cane, but no footsteps. And that as far as they got to. Mm. I was really enjoying that. Kind of reminded me a little bit of Agatha Christie. Um, well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, third person omniscient. Um, although it could almost be limited at times. Uh, it's very early in the piece. So yeah. you, you could still go the limited way, I think. Um, but there's an openness and a freedom of being able to go anywhere with omniscient, isn't there? Like you're, you're completely unconstrained. You can do whatever you like. And I actually found yeah, that it was very it was, enjoyable. There was air in the writing in that way. I, I thought it was, um, yeah, it, rem- it reminded me of an Agatha Christie. It was like, it was easy. Uh, like I just felt myself being carried along by, you know, uh, a spirit dragging me through one moment to the next. And it was very enjoyable to listen to. Yeah, I really liked that. Mm. Well, thank you. And once again, I we really would like to hear some of the uh, audience's pieces that they've developed in that 10 minutes. And uh, we will read them out on our next episode uh, if you submit it in time because our next episode is going to be coming out a couple of days before Christmas. And this is our book review and we're so excited to get this done because it's Curse Bunny by Chora Bung. And, um, Bora Chung. Bora Chung. Oh, okay, Bora Chung. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's translated by Anton Ho. And I hope I said that right. Gosh, that would be horrendous if I did not say that right. But I'm pretty sure I did. Um, and we're going to be Christmasing up our next episode because it is Christmas, the time of joy and a time of horror. If you're afraid of bunnies like I am, um, yeah, you would totally understand once you start reading the book. Well, that's thrilling. Um, and uh – I suppose a little film recommendation, if like Shannon, you're terrified of rabbits, Night of the Lepus, 1970s American uh, horror film, uh, has DeForest Kelly in it from of Star Trek fame and various other people. Uh, it's a ridiculous film, uh, but essentially giant bunny rabbits are uh, terrorizing the town. Uh, and I don't think I've, I've seen it. I've only seen it once, but I didn't get the sense that the tongue was in the cheek at all. I think they were quite deadly serious and it's uh, even funnier because of that. The little bunnies are bouncing at you and they're going to eat you. And uh, yeah. So, so get into that as well. I think we should have an, uh, a bunny themed Christmas Yes. Um, you said we were going to have uh, some Christmas brandy. Uh, so we're going to be having that. And um, what is – shush. There is a book um, – this is why I'm scared of bunnies. Actually, don't send bunny memes in because, no, that's not great. Um, Waterford's Down, is that the one with oh, the rabbits? Oh, Watership Down. Famous book. Yeah, Watership yeah, Down, yeah. They- they made it into a film and that's where it all started. So if you want to know the origin story, definitely check that movie out, the animation version. Yeah, and I've always found Art Garfunkel slightly slightly frightening or intimidating. I don't know why. I think it's because Paul Simon's so short and Art Garfunkel therefore looks like a towering uh, behemoth. But I've always – and maybe it's his hair. I don't know. Uh, wonderful singer, but just a terrifying mm-hmm. guy. 
I think there's something about bunnies. I mean, we've got Donnie Darko. I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one. Please, God, I'm not the only one. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I had lots of fun today, Gareth, and I can't wait to do our book review next week. Me neither. I mean, look, it wasn't as good as the original episode we recorded, which I, I remember being just mythologically amazing. Uh, just everything was but just... But it was a great tribute today. It was a wonderful tribute to what could have been uh, and how appropriate. So, you know, uh, yeah, next week, Bora Chung, Curse Bunny. I'm terrified. I'm excited. Highly stimulated. Uh, going to have lots of brandy. Going to have fruit cake. Possibly bunny ears if I can brave the crowds and find a store that has like old or or anticipatory Easter stuff. Um, and that, <laughs> that should be a lot of fun. Maybe one of the shops jumped ship and did it a week before Christmas because only after Christmas they're like, Easter is here. Cream eggs all the way. <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe, oh, maybe we should make our own like uh, holiday that's a mixture and it's called Creaster. Creaster. And it's a mixture. Michael Mass. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Gareth Mass. Gareth Mass. Shannon Mass. I don't know. Quite a mass. I don't know either. I think we're just rambling now. Are we? Yeah, we are. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to go get a second coffee. <laughs> and once again, I enjoyed this podcast. Hope everyone else did. And like and subscribe. Share to your friends if you're enjoying. And we would love to hear from you guys as well. See you all next week, everyone. Bye, everyone.